I'm Matt Putz, and I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning Technology here at Bethel University. I think that a lot of the skills that are important for online instructors are the same as the skills that are important for online learners. Uh, so some of those would be the ability to take initiatives with relationships at a distance. You know, are you the sort of person that's willing to reach out to somebody that you can't see, that's willing to take initiative? Um, and, uh, and even just general processes in education, are you willing to take a lot of initiative with making sure that things are working, with making sure things are moving along. Because if you tend to be passive in a distance environment or in an online environment, uh, there's a lot of potential for uh, chaos or for misunderstandings and those sorts of things. Um, when you're developing relationships at a distance, it's really important to be an excellent text-based communicator. So you've got to be able to write well. Uh, you've got to be able to express yourself well both formally and informally. Uh, when you're writing, and you've got to be able to know the difference and when those kinds of things are appropriate to do. And you've probably got to enjoy large volumes of distant communication. So if you don't like email, or if you're the sort of person that hates the telephone, you hate Skype, those kinds of things, then uh, you know the distant environment, the online environment may not necessarily be for you. But if you like those kinds of things, that's, uh, that might be a good environment for you. And it's really important to be able to insert yourself into a person's shoes that you can't see. So that's kind of an intangible, but it's, but it's important to be able to think through what is this person on the other end of this email or on the other end of this course site, uh, what is this person thinking when I wrote this, when I presented this? And some people seem to have a knack for being able to do that. Uh, I'm not sure that that's necessarily a developed skill. I suppose it could be if you ask a lot of good questions, but some people just seem to have a better knack for that than others. Um, I think it's also important to have some kind of an interest in, uh, in online tools. So people that, that, that enjoy using things like Facebook, people who enjoy using things like the web, um, they're going to have a little bit easier time with this sort of thing. Um, it's probably fairly obvious that you would need to be a fairly intuitive computer user. Anybody can develop skills with a, with a computer, but some people just seem to have uh, a little bit easier time doing that sort of thing. Interestingly, there are some things you don't have to be a genius at to be able to teach online. Uh, one of them is graphic design. You don't have to be a great artist to be able to uh, present a compelling course online. You don't have to be able to do web design. You know, that used to be the case where you'd have to be able to put your stuff up on the web and you'd have to know a lot of things about how to do that. And now because we have learning management systems because we have other tools like that. You don't have to know a lot of those real specific technical kinds of things uh, to be able to function well in an online environment. Things like being able to write HTML, being able to write in a web language. So it used to be true, but it's just really not true anymore. I think one of the most important things that is probably a revelation to new online instructors is this aspect of being always on when you're teaching online. There's not a real well-defined class period where it starts and it ends and you can get away and then maybe you have a few office hours and then you can maybe get away again. There's, there's to a degree, there's an expectation from online students that they're going to have access to you in some way more than they would if it was just a regular class period. And so sometimes it's hard to know how to create good boundaries to be able to manage that really well. And that is definitely a, a cost uh, when you're coming in as a first-time instructor. Also, course design in an online environment is, I would say, much more tedious and potentially rigorous than having to design courses in a face-to-face -face environment because everything has to be so explicit for the course to work. A lot of the nonverbal things that we do, a lot of the off-the-cuff things that we do when we're sitting in a face-to-face -face class just don't work in an online context, and so we have to think through what are all the things that I would say off the cuff but that I need to make really explicit for my students, and that's a lot of work, and I think a lot of new instructors don't necessarily realize how much work it is when they get started. Um, also, everything that you do in the class is very visible and reviewable, and you would think, well, in a face-to-face -face class that's true too, but someone isn't sitting in the back of your classroom with a video camera 
the entire time you're teaching and then looking at it later. But since so much of what you do in an online class is text-based, it's really easy for others to come back in and look at what you did. And so in a sense, there's the potential for greater review. There's a sense in which uh, you're on display a little bit more. Your words hang around because they're in text form. And, and that definitely, for some people, is a cost. And then I think the last thing I would say is that if you're used to viewing the presentation or the lecture as a real central part of what draws you to teaching, a lot of the aspects of that are removed uh, in, in the online arena. You, it doesn't mean you don't get to lecture, but the manner in which you do that is quite a bit different, and some of the vibes that you would get from your students aren't necessarily there. And so if that's a really big part of teaching for a first-time instructor, sometimes people find that to be a difficult thing to get past. Well, when you're building a course, um, I think it's important to figure out, first of all, does this course exist yet? Has it been taught in the face-to-face -face environment? And so if it does, you might as well start with that. If it doesn't, you probably have some generic course design work to do uh, that probably goes beyond the scope of what we're talking about here today. But once you have a course that has learning objectives, it has a, a basic kind of a flow to it, you understand how it's going to work, then what you want to do is chunk out the pure content in the course and the pure interaction in the course. Typically when we teach face-to-face, -face, we use these interactive lectures where we're combining a lot of different aspect, aspects of teaching in a single event. So we're providing content to the students, we're providing analysis to the students, we're asking them questions as a large group, maybe we're dividing them up into small groups, bringing them back, having them summarize, we're summarizing that, we're providing some more content. That kind of a fluid process doesn't work terribly well in an online environment. And so what it's important to do is to separate out which pieces of that process are specifically content where you could say there's 15 minutes of this thing I always talk about. That would be an example of a content chunk. What are those pieces? Or maybe the readings, those kinds of things. And what pieces are really purely interaction? This is something that the students need to talk with each other about. This is something that I need to describe in more of an interactive way. And if you look at your course, you'll probably find that most of the things you do in the course fall into one of those two uh, categories. And so one of the early things that I ask instructors to do is to chunk out their whole course based on those uh, two different kinds of activities. And then build some kind of a timeline with those chunks. I have my chunks. What order do I want them to go in? And when you're building a timeline for the online environment, sometimes you can put things in a little bit different order. Because before, maybe you would have been having students turn a paper in, for example, because they're coming physically to class, so the paper's due at the beginning of class. But now you're using the learning management system. They can turn the paper in any time of day, any day of the week. So maybe you want them to turn it in halfway through the week. Maybe you want to combine that with the discussion forum uh, assignment that you wouldn't have necessarily been able to do in a face-to-face -face class. So you develop out your timeline, says, here's where I want to use these different chunks, here's how I want to do things, and you may have added some new things in there as well that weren't there in your face-to-face -face course. And then you build your syllabus out of that. And notice we haven't yet even touched the learning management system. We haven't yet touched Moodle or Blackboard or anything like that. We're just now building out the blueprint for how the whole course is going to work. Once you've done that, you develop or acquire your media that you're going to use for content, whether that's print media, video media, maybe you've created a lecture using narrated PowerPoint that you're going to uh, tweak so it'll work well on the web. Um, and you also start to get, gather together your plans for how you're going to uh, organize your activities, whether those are discussion questions for your discussion forum and the order they're going to go in, or criterion for different other activities students are going to be participating in. You pull that all together, and then finally what you do is you build out that learning management system course site. And I prefer to, when I'm building a course, to build it out using as much task-centered language as I possibly can. Before you do this sort of thing, do this, and now do this, and now do this. And the learning management system we're using not Bethel, or that we're moving to, which is Moodle, tends to facilitate that in a very nice way. And so if you follow all of those steps, obviously that's just a very high-level overview, but if you follow those steps, if you don't get too caught up with trying to do things too early, with moving, uh, say, content development up earlier in the process, 
or moving your learning management system work up earlier in the process. If you do things in that order, it can be a pretty enjoyable experience. Probably one of the biggest rookie mistakes that I've seen is when instructors make the assumption that they can take the activities that they did in their face-to-face -face classroom and just plunk them into the online environment. Sometimes it actually does work, uh, but usually it works accidentally <laughs> if it works. And so it's important to think in terms of equivalency, not equalness, if you want to use that word. We want to get at the same learning objectives uh, in the online environment as we're getting at in the face-to-face -face environment, but we may use a different set of activities to turn that crank. And so it's important to not just make the assumption that I can do the same things that I did in my face-to-face -face classroom, or to get all frustrated when that doesn't work. I think it's good to just go in with the expectation that it's not necessarily going to work. Um, I also see new instructors oftentimes trying to make the course too time-bound. Uh, too synchronous. Uh, one of the advantages of online learning is that it enables you to spread conversations out. It enables you to spread activities out. It enables students who don't necessarily have the, the, the scheduling to be able to drop by for a four-hour evening or a two-hour class during the day to participate in something. And the more time-bound we make the course, uh, the more we structure synchronous, at the same time kinds of activities into the course, the less access it gives them, and the more difficult it is to try to use the tools that are really effective in a distant environment, an online environment. So I see that as a, as a mistake. Um, another mistake is that of not making things explicit enough. And I think I've said that before, but we can't make up for a lack of explicity on the fly. We have to make sure that we are taking care of all that stuff beforehand. So if I go in to teach a course that I've developed and I haven't decided beforehand, here's exactly how we're going to run this thing. All the cracks are going to start to show up. And a lot of face-to-face -face courses operate that way. And so if you just try to drop them right into an online environment without thinking about a lot of that stuff, uh, the cracks start to show definitely pretty fast. And this goes along with it. Uh, it's easy to underestimate the amount of rigor that is involved in developing a, a good online course. So I have seen some instructors kind of blow that off a little bit, but I have very rarely seen instructors blow it off twice. Because usually when they come around the second time, they realize, man, if I didn't plan X, Y, Z, it's going to come back and bite me in the class. So I need to make sure that's taken care of. Um, and along with that, it's important to pay attention to consistent formatting, consistent language, because all those kinds of things just contribute toward the student's sense that this course is a predictable environment that I can understand, that I can participate in, that I can learn from, and uh, there aren't all sorts of surprises coming my way. Um, I have seen some instructors as well try to get students to actually do too much from a technological point of view. There's a fine balance there. Online students, now uh, those that are properly suited for it, probably tend to be a little bit more savvy technologically than students that prefer a face-to-face -face environment. Probably. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're technological geniuses, just like all of us aren't technological geniuses, necessarily. And so there's a fine balance that needs to be found between asking students to do nothing technologically and not really take advantage of the environment, and on the other hand, asking them to do way too much, and then spending half of your class time just trying to help the students jump through all the technological hoops that you created for them that might not have been uh, necessary. Um, I've also seen some instructors uh, confuse the sorts of questions that you would use, say, for a discussion forum, as opposed to the sorts of questions you would use for a more formal paper. That's a real common one. So sometimes you'll have instructors that will, will write discussion questions, or they'll call them discussion questions, but really they're much more analytical, they're much more literature reviewish. They're much more the sorts of questions that everyone should be coming forth with similar answers on, which don't necessarily contribute to good discussion. And so it's important to figure out, I want, I want my students to converse about something, or I want my students to tell me they know something, and to know what kind of environment is it best to use those kinds of questions in. Um, and then finally, there's this aspect of either being too present in a course, or being not present and enough in a course. Uh, if I'm too present in a course, meaning I'm responding to every single thing the students do, uh, all of my instructions are incredibly explicit, 
I'm there all week long, they can't ever get away from me, then what students end up doing is continually pointing themselves toward me instead of conversing with each other. And on the other hand, if I'm not present enough, then students can start to get the idea that I'm not paying attention, that I'm not active, and uh, that I don't really know what they're up to. And so it's important to find that balance as well. I think when you're developing forum discussion prompts, it's important to combine a couple of different things. You want students to be able to demonstrate that they know something. Uh, we want to see that they read something. We want to see that they interacted with some kind of content that they can then bring back to the class. I think that's important. So to show some kind of mastery of a set of ideas, but then we don't want to stop there. It's important then to say, now how does that connect to your world? How does that connect to something you've experienced? to something that you do, to something you worry about, to something you're happy about, to something you grew up with, anything like that. And when we do that sort of thing, what we're doing is we're allowing them to create their unique response to what could have been a very generic question. So that's the sort of thing that gives other students hooks to hook into when they're going to when they're going to respond to them. So all your answers don't end up being the same. And then for replies, uh, I think it's really important for a student to first of all demonstrate somehow that they understood at least part of what the other person said by repeating it, by paraphrasing it, by describing it, then to push it forward a little bit to say here's how I hook into that, here's how my experience mirrors that, here's how I disagree with that, and here's why, here's something I read about that, uh, here's an experience that I had, and then to work very hard to make sure that, that that reply is not closing off conversation, like that's the final answer. So I encourage students to have all three of those things in their replies. Some kind of demonstration that they knew what the other person was saying, some kind of attachment point, and then some kind of maybe a question like, what does everybody else think about this? So that you're not closing off discussion. I think those are the kinds of things uh, that make for really good uh, discussion questions. So here are some examples of some prompts. This would be an ineffective prompt. Describe four of the major benefits of the development of the interstate transportation system. Now, the students may have read that in a book, and they can do that, but likely if you have 18 students in your class, you're going to get 18 responses that are all really similar and potentially really boring because that question is actually not that exciting. But a better prompt might be, describe those four major benefits, and why do you think they were benefits? That's a better question. The students still may be playing off of content that they've read, and so if the students are working with the same content pool, you still may end up with similar kinds of answers. But probably the best kind of question would be, describe four benefits of the interstate transportation system. Why do you think they're important, and how has the interstate transportation system impacted your life? You know, where have you gone on it? And that sort of thing. Now all of a sudden, those benefits become benefits to me. And it's something that I can interact with in a, in a way that's going to be unique from probably the way that everyone else interacts with it. So the degree to which we can take the content that students are really needing to understand and then force it in a real friendly way back into their lives, back into their experiences, and require them to bring those things back to the rest of the class, I think that's the degree to which those forum questions uh, are going to be effective. There are some roles that an instructor can play in facilitating these discussions in an online context because a lot of times instructors ask, what am I supposed to do? Do I just sit back and watch it go by? Um, what do I do? Well, first of all, I think it's important that for instructors to read all the posts that are coming into their classes. It doesn't mean you have to read them all in depth, you have to memorize them all, you have to mark them all up, but it's important for students to at least be able to uh, give the students the distinct impression that they are aware of what the students are talking about. Um, and then instructors can facilitate discussion in a number of ways. They can point out great ideas that are not being paid attention to. So if the student has said something in a discussion post and everybody's replying over here in another thread but nobody's paying attention to it, the instructor can say to the rest of the class, hey, wait a minute. There's a really important thing that this person said. You should all think about it and maybe say something about it. Um, sometimes you'll have misguided or off-topic or even inhospitable kinds of posts. 
And those are the kinds of situations where an instructor can step in and redirect things a little bit and just make sure everybody's on the right page. Occasionally, an instructor may actually have to delete a post out and warn a student about something that was just completely wrong that they shouldn't have done. Um, but it's important for the instructor to at least show their faces with, with some kind of regularity in the discussion. Again, without turning the students toward them. What we don't want is for the students to start answering the questions as if they're just talking to us. We want them to talk to each other. So there's that balance we want to maintain between, again, always being there uh, and never being there. Sometimes instructors will ask, well, what if I've got some content that I really want to add to the conversation? How do I do that? I think one of the best ways to do that is to add it somewhere else in the course and send students a message. Like, for instance, instead of putting it into the discussion forum that the students are working in right there. So, for instance, an instructor may think, oh, there's this really great article that I wasn't thinking of when I designed the course, but the students have just basically come up with a concept that would relate really well to that. How do I express that? Go into your announcements area and say, I've posted a copy of this article in the course site. It's located here. And the reason I posted it was because you were all talking about this in your discussion forum last week. And I think it'd be really great if you read it. So now you've done a great job of providing new content for them, but you haven't really interrupted their discussion. They can continue doing the sorts of things they're doing. You've also told them that you're paying attention to what they're talking about without necessarily inserting yourself into the conversation and stopping it. Um, so that's a great way for instructors then to be able to interject content into a conversation without, without stopping things. So discussion forums aren't the only way to have a conversation online. Uh, and instructors are often looking for more rich ways to be able to have students interact. And uh, there are some really good synchronous tools, meaning communication at the same time kinds of tools that are available that instructors can use. Bethel has a system that we subscribe to called Adobe Connect, which is a sort of online live classroom where students can chat with each other in a chat window. They can, uh, they can use their webcam to show themselves in a video window. They can use audio to talk with each other. Um, it's very easy to show a PowerPoint and talk the class through a PowerPoint. So it's really great for student presentations, say end of class presentations, and that sort of thing. So that's a really flexible environment. There is a little bit of a danger in having an environment like that in that there's a temptation for people who are migrating from the face-to-face -face environment to the online environment to think, well, we'll just do a two-hour Adobe Connect session every week, and that'll cover my class. And probably you'd be missing out on the richness of all the other sorts of things you can do in an online context if you think that way. Uh, and also you're, you're obviously creating that time um, bound kind of set of constraints that is probably not as good for an online student. Uh, but Adobe Connect is a great way to do that. If you've got students that are doing group work uh, where they don't necessarily have to be together in class to do group work and they, you set it up so they can meet whenever they want, they can use things like their th uh, three-way plans on their cell phones, they can use Skype, which is a free uh, internet telephony system that also allows for at least one-to-one -one video now. There are instant messaging systems out there that students can use, and Moodle actually has a chat system in it. So if you wanted to set up a chat environment just in the learning management system, uh, that can be done. So those are some other tools that can allow people to be able to communicate uh, over a distance. Uh, wikis are another way for people to collaborate online. They're not really a great way for people to converse, uh, but they do provide a way for people to be able to develop a base of knowledge together. And what a wiki does is it allows a group of people to collaboratively create uh, a web set of web pages, link web pages together. And of course, the most famous wiki out there right now is Wikipedia, but you can create wikis right in your learning management system courses. And so this is really good for uh, a really great tool for students who are putting together a group project and they're trying to pull together a lot of different pieces of information and maybe argue a little bit over what order it needs to go in and so they can edit each other's entries and move things around. Um, it's also a really great tool for meta-learning because a lot of students that are uh, going into larger organizations today will be encountering wikis as a way to just manage knowledge across the organization. And so if you're teaching students uh, whether they're going to be educators or business people or scientists or whatever, if you're teaching them 
how to uh, manage knowledge this way now in school, they're going to be that much better equipped when they get out into an environment where they're maybe not doing the same assignment, so the content's completely different, but now they've learned this method for, uh, for compiling and, uh, and ordering information together and talking about it together. I also want to talk about this broader philosophical idea about how online learning allows us to broaden our notions of community. Uh, sometimes when teachers are trying to figure out, can I teach a certain class online, there's a temptation to say, the nature of this class is such that if the students don't get together and talk about their life experiences in a face-to-face -face context, if they don't bring things together in a real visceral way, that the class doesn't work as well because they don't... I don't know, there's something about having coffee that some people just think is really, really uh, magical. And can't do that at a distance as well. But something that's really easy to forget is that when you have distant students taking a class, they're already embedded in their own communities. They're already embedded, oftentimes, in very different cultures from the one they would be embedded in if they were here uh, physically at, in a place together. So by not ripping them out of their places, by letting them stay in their places, we then as instructors have the opportunity to send them back to their places to collect bits and pieces of that culture, to collect the knowledge that's around them, to talk to the people that are around them, and to bring all of that back to the entire class. And so if it's done well, if it's done right, an online class, especially with distant students, can be an even richer kind of environment just because of all the amazing content that students are bringing from all these different places. Uh, that they're coming from. So that's not really a tool that's different for communicating, but it does illustrate how if we combine all these tools together really well, uh, we can create environments that are just incredibly rich online. So what are some best practices for uh, instructor behaviors while the class is going on? Now, we're making the assumption that the class is designed well. If it's not designed well, then there are a lot of extra difficulties that get dropped into the pot. It's really hard to know exactly what to tell an instructor to do. But assuming the class is designed well, it's, it's designed explicitly, the students don't have a tremendous amount of confusion about where they're supposed to go, there are a few things that I try to pay attention to when I'm teaching. Uh, first of all, I try to spend a lot of time staying out of the way and not getting uh, under the wheels of the cart as it's going forward, letting it move forward. So I'm doing everything as po that's possible to help the students keep facing each other, keep communicating with each other, and only communicating back with me when it's necessary structurally uh, for them to do that. And that assumes that I've got a very explicit task-based design that the students can work their way through together uh, as a group. Uh, I also think it's important to keep your promises. So, and we make promises to students by the way we design things, and that, that means providing timely feedback. It means getting back their grades on time. And it probably means using some kind of a communication tool like the grade book, the online grade book, to get those grades back so they can see them right away. It means returning email quickly. It means that if we publish a cell phone number for them that we actually answer it or that we actually return messages and those sorts of things. So I think keeping promises in an online context where students are not able to get to us except through electronic means typically. That's very, very important for our credibility as instructors and for the students' sense that they're able to progress in the class. Um, I also, also try to make sure that my communications with students point as much as possible back to the course structures. So uh, I'll be going along teaching a course and I'll realize, oh no, I forgot about this thing that I need people to know about and it's really central to the course's content. Uh, but I forgot to put it in, and we're all going to do that from time to time. I've got two choices. I can shoot out an email to everybody and attach a document and say, oh, I forgot to give this to you all, and then they've all got it in their inboxes. Uh, or what I can do is I can post that content in the class site, go back to my news forum or my announcements area, and say to the students, hey, I forgot to put something in the class. I think it's really important that we all take a look at it. It's located here. And the next time I teach the course, it's there. Uh, and the students can continue to trust the structure of what they see in the online course. They're not wondering, when's he going to send us another email with something attached to it that I've got to keep somewhere uh, that I don't want to lose. So whenever we can point back to the process that we've already developed, the course site that we've already developed, I think that's, a really, really, that's really good for the students. And then probably the final thing I would say is, 
that when we do make mistakes, uh, we need to handle them with lots of grace, and because students are going to point them out right away, because uh, online learners tend to be more proactive that way, and we need to handle them with lots of communication. So apologies are great, and uh, allowing students to be able to have grace time because we didn't do something right is great. We're going to gain on the other end uh, because the students then are going to provide grace back our direction as well uh, as we teach the course. I'm going to talk about some stuff that I think works pretty well in it and uh, then give some pointers as well. I should be clear that I can't really evaluate the manner in which the course is being facilitated by looking at this, but, uh, but we can take a look at the design. First of all, some stuff that works. First of all, if you look through this course site, you'll see that there's a real clean, basic usage of the course site. It's not cluttered. It avoids the use of too many different fonts and colors, etc. So it's really clean and it's really easy to look at. The inclusion of an HTML version of the syllabus is nice. If I click on this, I can see the syllabus right away. Now this isn't completely necessary. There is a PDF version of it as well here, but the HTML version is nice, definitely. Uh, it's very obvious as you look through this course which activities go with each week. Uh, students can actually go through this week, they can finish the week, and they can in a sense check it off and move on and that's a really good student oriented way of designing a course also each week has a really consistent format and a theme that goes with the week so every week feels similar the students get used to the pace of the different weeks they get used to the uh, the format of the weeks so they don't have to think about that every time they walk into a new week uh, most of the documents as you'll see here that are linked are in PDF format and uh, that just makes it easier for students to be able to access those documents. Word documents, for instance, don't open up as nicely in all browsers. Uh, so the PDF documents are really nice. When you look at assignment descriptions, like for instance this assignment for week one, you see that all the instructions for the assignment are right there in the description. And the same thing is true uh, for forums as well. Uh, such as this one right here. So the students don't have to go somewhere else to find the description of what they're supposed to do. Also, the forum questions um, require the students to both demonstrate knowledge of the assigned materials and then relate that knowledge directly to their own experiences, which can lead to good discussion. And you can see that down here in the questions down below. So in all, this is a, this is a well-constructed course. Here are some pointers that I would give. First of all, the, the week overviews, which are well constructed, are in PDF format, uh, which means I have to open up the PDF and then I have to look through the whole thing to see what I'm supposed to do for the week. And probably as a student, I would have to then reference this as I was working my way through this week. And it would probably be nicer if the contents of that overview were just spaced throughout the week here using labels such as this. Uh, and that sort of thing. It would make the course site a little bit more active and probably a little bit more intuitive uh, for the students. Also, some of the uh, content from these weekly overviews are, are included in the assignments themselves. For instance, this right here is also in that week one assignment description. And whenever you end up repeating yourself in an online course in the content, uh, it can create a couple of problems. First of all, you end up with less accuracy when you're reusing the course because it's very easy to forget uh, to change things in two different places. And also, uh, for students, when things are re repeated in different places, it can create a little bit of confusion. They can sometimes start wondering, uh, what am I missing here? Have I seen everything? Uh, because they're seeing things pop up in multiple places. And so, if at all possible, it's good to make sure that stuff just sits in one place and that the students can interact with it right there without having to reference uh, a different document. Uh, the only other things I would say about this course re uh, for pointers would have to do with the gradebook. And uh, a couple of things I would say about that. First of all, it might be more functional long term with this gradebook if the instructor was using uh, percentage weighting instead of manual weighting. You can see all of these categories are using the sum of grades aggregation method which means that these scores are just being added up uh, down to a thousand points. And uh, so if this was done using percentage weighting, it would be a little bit easier 
uh, to move the course from uh, term to term and change assignments uh, in the course. Also, you can see, and this is minor, but the categories aren't properly implemented down here at the bottom. All of these discussion forum columns didn't make it actually into the weekly forums category, and so that would need to be fixed. But otherwise, this is a, a well-constructed course, and I think I would enjoy taking this very much if I were a student in this course. Well, one of the things that helps you tell if an online course is progressing well is the amount of interaction between the students themselves. Uh, it's, uh, it's easy to get students talking to you directly as a teacher by asking them really direct questions and making them come back and answer those questions. But if an online course is going well, the students are interacting with each other. They're pointing their faces toward each other and they're interacting with each other. So. That, that's one way you can tell right away, is this working well? There's lots of responses and replies to students' posts and those kinds of things. Um, the other way you can tell, or at least one other way you can tell that an online course is progressing well, is the kinds of questions that you get from students. If the kinds of questions that you're getting from students are mostly concerned with, I can't find this, I don't know how to do this, um, they're having trouble with just processing the course and it's not making sense to them, that's kind of a bad sign. But if the questions they're asking you actually have to do with the content that you're presenting, they're higher level questions, um, they're questions that have to do with um, them developing, say, a paper or a project that they're working on, and they're getting past the actual course design and really getting into the content and getting into the application of the content, then you can tell that the course is actually working. And obviously those are the kinds of things that you would expect in a face-to-face -face course as well. It's just that in face-to-face -face courses, we often don't have to think about those kinds of things. But in an online course, definitely being able to process the amount of conversations students are having between each other and the quality of the questions they're coming back to us as instructors with are a way to tell how well the course is progressing. First of all, since so much of an online course is typically written material, it's important to really manage how much written material you're expecting students to provide you with that you're actually going to look at, that you're going to pay attention to. Um, just because we can look now at every detail of every conversation that every student is having with another student doesn't mean that we're ever going to have time to do that. You know, in a face-to-face -face class, we may split our students up into groups and tell them to go discuss things. And then we may hover around a bit and kind of catch little glimpses of what they're talking about. But when we bring all the students back together to the, the big class, all we're really looking for there is maybe snippets from them or summaries from them uh, regarding what they talked about. And we're never going to go back and look at a transcript of everything every group said. But in an online course, we can do that because we're, we're doing a lot of asynchronous discussion. The students are writing everything down. And so we can get trapped into this idea that we need to be that rigorous, as rigorous as we would be like with a paper, uh, with all of those discussions. And so it's important for us as instructors to make sure that we're doing a good job managing our own expectations. How rigorous do I want to be in my evaluation of what uh, students are writing? And it may involve, especially after you get more experienced teaching online courses, it may actually involve asking your students to write a little bit less. It might. Uh, but you have to judge that as you go through uh, from course to course. Um, the other suggestion I would make is that instructors should do their best to use the tools in the learning management system in Moodle or in Blackboard as well as possible. So if you're going to have students turning a paper in, uh, make sure you use the assignment tool that allows them to upload the paper directly into the learning management system and then you can do your evaluation right there. Uh, get comments back to them and do that all within the tool. Rather than saying to students, I want you to send me an email uh, with your, your paper attached to it and then I'll shoot you an email back, that creates all sorts of management issues. You've got to store those emails somewhere. It's not all nice and tidy in the learning management system. Same thing if you're uh, having some kind of a vote on what the class is going to do. Uh, say you're putting together groups or something like that. Uh, there's a polling feature in both the learning management systems that Bethel has used that allows you to set up a really easy uh, 
polling environment and you can see really fast who wants to do what and you don't have to use again some kind of email communication a lot of times as teachers we tend to default back to email when we don't know what to do in the learning environment because we're used to that it makes sense to us and even some of the hard work that we have to do with filing things we're okay with that because it means we don't have to learn the system and so if you want to really manage workload though long term as an online instructor best to learn the system and, and leverage it. I think the biggest thing that separates a, a, good on, a good online instructor from a great online instructor is attention to detail. Attention to detail. And when you're designing the course, that primarily means the ability to imagine what's going to happen before it happens and think through every possible little hiccup that could occur in designing that course. And no one can do that perfectly the first time. That's why it's so important to have other people have some input in your course design when you're first starting out teaching an online course. Uh, but in, in the design process, that attention to forethought detail is going to be really, really important. And then as the class is playing itself out as you're facilitating the course, attention to detail is really expressed through responsiveness to the students. So it's being able to uh, the great online instructors can really tell very quickly whether or not students are engaging the process. They can tell where students are having problems. They can tell where there are hiccups. And they can, they can make a move to correct things if they need to do that right away. Uh, teachers that are not as experienced or teachers that are maybe just kind of average online instructors either won't care as much about that or they maybe don't perceive the same sorts of things that the great ones would. So. Uh, teachers that pay attention to the potential spots at which students are going to get stressed in taking the course are really the great teachers. They pay attention to this structural stress piece. And structural stress is any kind of stress that students experience uh, that isn't directly related to the learning objectives for the course. So teachers that are really paying attention to, to the things that will avoid that sort of stress for students, those are really the great instructors. Everything I'm going to list here is something you could do in a face-to-face -face course, too. So these things aren't necessarily unique to online courses, uh, but they do work well in online courses. Um, I should say this, too, before I give this short little list. It's really tough to improve your course if you're not paying attention while it's happening. And so it's, it's really difficult to go back after the course has been taught and, and figure out how you want to change it if you weren't really specifically paying attention to it in some very specific ways while you were teaching it. And so some ways you can do that are, first of all, by having some kind of a student usability survey. All students take a course evaluation after the course is done, and they talk about a lot of different things, and they answer a lot of different questions. But I think it's really important to give a student usability survey maybe just a week or two into the course. And the only kinds of questions you're asking in that survey are, how easy is it for you as a student to use this course, to participate in this course? What are the roadblocks? We're not talking about concepts that they're not getting because they're going to learn those things through the content that you're providing. But we're talking about them being able to find things, them being able to navigate things, them being able to understand what you expect. So that's really important. You can make some really good uh, decisions in a, in, a, uh, in a formative way, not just in a summative way about the course, as the course is going if you've got that usability survey in there. And then obviously that data is going to be available to you when the course is done as well. And maybe you want to do another survey when the course is done and see if things improved, especially if you had a lot of negative comments uh, on that first survey. So that's one way. So just ask your students, how is this working for you? And they'll be a good judge of whether it actually works. Uh, also, as you're teaching the course, take notes about what's comfortable for you and what's not comfortable for you. So there may be points at which you're feeling like this is flying along great, but there may be other points which you're feeling like, this doesn't feel right, this feels uncomfortable, it feels clunky, I feel like this is not working. And that's usually a pretty good indication, uh, if you're an experienced teacher at all, that something is wrong with the course. And you may not even know what it is, you may need to bounce that off a colleague or a peer later on, uh, but take notes on it when it happens. That way, when you're done with the course and you're out of the rush a little bit and you're able to think back about it, you've got some memories 
uh, that you can work from. And uh, as I said, it's always good to have some kind of a trusted peer, probably in your discipline, and hopefully with someone with some online teaching experience. Take a look at your notes after you're done, take a look at your course, and just give you some feedback on it. Uh, usually that's a lot less threatening um, than before the course. Uh, obviously you want people looking at things before if possible, but when you're going into the course, and especially if it's your first time teaching that course or your first time teaching online at all, you're not always sure what's going to work. You don't know what to hang on to. Sometimes it's just best to go out there and do it uh, and then have that conversation uh, when you're done. Also, when you're getting ready to reuse your, co your course, you'll find that some things work really easily and some things don't. Like if you're getting ready to transition your syllabus from this semester's instance to next semester's instance, when you're getting ready to, trans, uh, to transfer this course site in Moodle or in Blackboard to next semester, some things go really fast and some things take a long time. And if it takes a lot of work, that may be an indication that maybe you've done something in your design uh, that could be smoothed out a little bit uh, for the next time around. And then probably the most important thing is to go back and make your changes while all those memories are really fresh. So maybe you're not, maybe you taught in the fall and you're not teaching again until next fall. Don't wait until the summer to go make your changes. You have access to the learning management system, you have access to the syllabus, you have access to your memories and your notes. Make those changes now or at least make a list of the changes you're going to make while the memories are still fresh. For people who want to grow as online educators, there are three suggestions I'd make. First of all, there are some things you can read. There are some journals out there, there are some books out there. A couple that I would suggest, uh, a journal I would suggest is the IRODL, the International Review of Research in Open and Distance Learning, uh, which is put out by Athabasca University. It's an open journal, it's free, it's online, and it's also considered one of the top journals uh, in online learning in the world. And so there's no reason not to read it. It's, it's easy to get to. And there's another production uh, through Athabasca University called uh, The Theory and Practice of Online Learning, which is now in its second edition. It's edited by Terry Anderson. It's a huge book, but it's divided up into very useful chapters. It's also an open book, uh, meaning it's freely available uh, to the general public, and you can get that off the web as well. Anything that Athabasca University up in Canada puts out is, in my opinion, worth reading. Uh, they just have some of the finest researchers available up there. So if you're looking for journals and books to start in, start with those two. Um, also, I think that uh, instructors can move forward in their understanding of online learning by just learning more about the technologies that they're actually using. So if you're the sort of person that maybe isn't naturally given to learning about how the web works or how different media production uh, tools work. It may be worth uh, taking a class or sitting with a colleague that knows more about that and just learning how some of those kinds of things work. If you can learn how to use something like the HTML language, which is actually really simple, uh, believe it or not, uh, you'll understand immediately a lot more about how the World Wide Web works, for example. So there are some technical pieces that just might make your work as an online instructor more intuitive. And the last thing that I would say is that if you don't have an education degree or an education certificate, or if you don't have any formal training in education, in other words, all your, your knowledge about education, which may be significant, but it's been gained just in, a, in the practical environment, it can really help to go back and get something like that in a formal way. Uh, get an education certificate or, um, uh, or get some kind of a degree in that area. It's, it's, uh, it's not that you can't teach in the face-to-face -face environment or you can't teach in the online environment without those things, but the cracks in a person's formal knowledge tend to show up a lot more in the online environment uh, when those things aren't present. And so it's just a way to be able to shore up some of these areas that maybe you don't have a lot of formal knowledge in. One way, and, and I've talked about this before, is rigor in design. When, you, when you're teaching uh, in an online environment, you're forced to be more rigorous in the way you line things up, in the way that you think about how things are going to happen. Because the course site really replaces the teacher as the center of functionality for the course. And the course site is not as flexible 
as an instructor would be in a face-to-face -face classroom. And so there's just this need to make sure things are lined up. And teachers that have taught in an online context seem to start thinking a lot more rigorously about how they're going to manage their classroom environment. Um, maybe because they think they have to, or maybe just because they've grown to like it. And they realize that this creates a lot more avenues for growth uh, for their students when they're a little more organized in the classroom environment. The other really big way uh, that I've seen that online instruction can inform face-to-face -face instruction is the hybridization of content and instruction, where instructors that used to spend a lot of time in their in their face-to-face -face time lecturing, talking to the students, now can take a lot of that content, they can boil it down into chunks that are a little bit more manageable, 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, put it in an aerated PowerPoint, put it in a video or in a document, have the students take a look at that, before class time, have the students demonstrate somehow that they've looked at it before class time through a journal entry or something like that. And then class time can now be reserved for sorts of things that are hard to do in an online context and for conversation. Students can spend that time reflecting with each other about what they've learned. And now the, the, the period within which class can happen, the period of time has now been expanded significantly and it takes a lot of pressure off that one to two to three hour uh, block of time, whatever it is for class, uh, with regard to content. We can now just have a relaxed conversation about, about what we learn. It allows us as teachers to do the things that I think we all feel we do well, which is guide the students uh, through this knowledge base without having to just tell them about all of it. First of all, uh, research shows unequivocally that there is no significant difference uh, in student outcomes between uh, courses that are delivered face-to-face -face and courses, uh, courses that are technologically mediated as long as the designs are equivalent. And that's been well known for years and years and years and years. The uh, distance learning field has known about this. The research has been there. Higher education institutions uh, and groups of faculty in those institutions have taken longer to accept those ideas, uh, but those things are be those ideas are becoming more accepted in higher ed, and so I see that as part of the future of higher education. I see the general groups of faculty at universities uh, in North America, for certain, and and across the world, just becoming more comfortable with this idea that we can deliver high quality education both in the physical classroom and in the virtual classroom, and uh, there are ways to do that, and there are ways to do it well. So that's one thing I would say is definitely the future of online education. Also, um, I think that the hybridization of all learning processes is probably in the future uh, of online education where it's it's not just being viewed as a way to do education at a distance, but it's being seen as a way to amplify and, uh, and help the educational process no matter where it's happening. So face-to-face -face courses no longer have to be just face-to-face. -face. You have the advantage of having that face-to-face -face time but we also have all these great online tools that we can use to augment uh, what's going on in the face-to-face -face environment and play off of it. Uh, thirdly, um, uh, and this is mostly from a design standpoint, I see the continuation of a couple of schools of thought. There's one school of thought that says that the instructor is at the center of all the processes that have to do with educating students on a certain topic, which means that the instructor is uh, is the content expert, the instructor is the instructional designer, the instructor is the facilitator, the assessor, all those kinds of things. And I see that, that uh, train of thought continuing. I think there will continue to be a large quantity of instructors that are designing one-off courses and they are presenting online to students. They're, they'll be given opportunities to do that and they'll be doing it to varying degrees of quality. Some of them will do it very, very well. And some of them may not do it as well, but there's going to be that's going to continue. I see this parallel line of thought that says that if we're going to create consistent programmatic experiences for students, in other words, where they're having a kind of consistent experience across an entire program of study, that there's going to need to be some kind of standardization process that goes into that. That's going to happen at the design level for those programs, and so there will be other uh, instances in higher ed and other places, other uh, situations where um, 
you maybe have a team of designers and you have a team of content experts coming together to design an entire program and there may be other people teaching it other than those designers uh, and content experts. So I don't see either of those two processes going away. I think we're going to see both of them operating in parallel uh, and probably informing each other a lot going forward from a design perspective.